Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome everyone to our heartfelt space where we weave hope, wisdom, compassion, and an understanding into the fabric of our conversation about one of life's most profound challenges, and that's grief and loss. We recognize that there are few experiences that cut as deeply as the pain of losing a loved one, especially when the loss comes at the hand of a silent battle with inner demons. Today, we're going to be stepping into that realm, often shrouded in silence and taboo, the heart-wrenching topic of suicide. We're engaging in a candid conversation with Dr. Keith McNally, whose multifaceted life story includes surviving suicide, as well, if that wasn't enough, a heart attack. Among his many pursuits now, he is aiming to support suicide survivors as well as their families. Our guest has a diverse professional background as a social worker, a doctorate in educational leadership, and has a survivor's testimony. He also brings a wealth of insight into the labyrinth of human suffering and resilience. And I'd love you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Keith McNally to our show today. Welcome, Keith. And thank you so much. It's been a, this is going to be quite a conversation. <laughs> I think so. And before we get going, I'm just would like to say I'm so grateful that you are here with us today. And I want to celebrate your, your existence here. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. I feel honored, I really do, to be discussing this topic with you. Well, how do you want to get started? How do you want to get started? Well, I'd love to discover throughout your varied career and your personal experiences, which chapter of your life has resonated with you most deeply and why? The chapter that has resonated most deeply is the present chapter being written. And so love there, are it. Lot, there are lots of different chapters uh, in my life. But I think as I, and I'll just say I because I can only reference myself, as I recognize how to write those chapters, uh, the book becomes a bit more interesting. And so I say that because you're right. I've had a couple of different. Uh, career pivots, you know, it wasn't actually, uh, you mentioned I was a social worker, you know, early, early on, it was mm -hmm. actually a U.S. Marine before that. And so after, after I graduated high school, I joined, you know, I live here in America. Uh, I joined the service and was a Marine. And after that, I went to college and became a social worker. So I was a mental health professional for many, many years, over a decade. Um, mm -hmm. And then made the transition into information technology um, with a master's in computer information systems. And then transitioned again into uh, a thought college. Uh, and so I've had a couple of zigs and zags in my career. But today, uh, you're right. I have officially attempted suicide three times. And that seems like a lot. And it probably is. Uh, but I I usually don't credit the one in college or my you know when I was doing my mid twenties I was in graduate school, mm -hmm. and but the you know 2013 and then again in 2021, and then of course as you said uh, I've survived a heart attack as well so I am I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing well or doing poorly in the fact that I'm always facing death in some way shape or form, 
and I'm coming out the other side uh, a little bit different. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but I sometimes think that these experiences, these huge challenges in our lives are not only for our own experience, but out when you look back, it's to bring something to be of benefit, to be of service to somebody else. Is that how you look at your life now? Now, yes. So not always, that's not always been the case. And so if we're going back to, you know, which chapter is the most valuable, it's the present day. And so post-2021, so we're dealing with end of the quarantine, end of COVID-19, and I'm unemployed. Uh, And I'm unemployed for quite a number of months, so up to a year. And at that time, being 51, having a house, you know, I've now have, she's 13 years old, so I have a daughter. Uh, so as a man in his, you know, going through midlife crisis, but not his own by, by design, by universe imploding upon me, because nothing seems to be working. So can't find a job, mm-hmm. can't pay the bills, losing money, losing value in myself, losing confidence in myself. I take a deep sigh because, you know, I wanted to end it all. I didn't want to wake up another day feeling that I was meaningless and had Mm -hmm. no value and purpose. And so when you wake up every day with that as your, your mindset, that is my thinking. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's difficult. It's challenging. uh, And it's downright frustrating um, and scary because I can't do the things that normal people can do, you know, you know, yes, I can breathe. Yes, I could put on a shirt, but, you know, I am not my full self. I can't even get a job. You know, what in the world is wrong with me that yeah. nobody finds me valuable? And when you have that type of thinking, it turns inside and you think to yourself, I'm not valuable. So it was that thinking that took you down into a very dark spot a very dark space. Mm -hmm. Gonna pause there for a moment because you mentioned that your first suicide was at uh, college. Mm -hmm. And I thought I heard you mention that you were a mental health professional. Was that you? I was. So my first Mm -hmm. college degree was social work. And so in the state of North Carolina, again, in the contiguous states, uh, I was a mental health professional uh, for, like I said, over a dozen years, about a decade or more. And so I had worked with uh, people who had real mental illness. And so typically either kids with behavioral problems or adults with schizophrenia and depression and things like that. So the gamut of mental illness. Um, I, I've for, for myself, Again, it wasn't the fact that I'm mentally ill, so I don't have a diagnosis. I don't have any diagnosis. Yeah. Although some people have said you probably should, um, and I don't. I say that tongue in cheek a little bit, but at the same time, I recognize that as a human being, I deal with frustrations, I deal with issues in life, just like anybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, I just didn't have the resources, either family or financial or you know emotional support of people in my circle that I could turn to and say, Hey, um, I need some help. So when you don't have those resources, life gets scary. Um, now today I do. And so I made it my intention past 2021 to change everything about my life. If there was, if there was something to change about my life, everything had to change about my life. And so I made it very intentional to connect with people, develop relationships, change my thinking around how I'm going to approach a career once I've, you know, once I found the job. Um, and how then can I help people? And I know that sounds cliche, but when you're in that space and mm-hmm. you can't see out of it, God, that sucks. Um, it is the worst possible place to be in life. Because you're alone. And the worst place to be in life is to be alone. 
Yeah, we're not meant to do life alone, are we, as human beings? We seek that connection. So for you, you had nobody in your life. Was that because of we were just coming out of COVID? Or was that how you had structured your life at that point? Um, well, to give it perspective, uh, I, I am married. Uh, and I do have my 13-year-old dog ball. My 13, she's 13 now. She'll be 14, gosh, in a month. Um, but even with that, when you're faced with life situations that you never really developed strategies for, mm. um, and so, you know, I go back to, you know, where are our parents? Because there are so many coaches in the world for every little thing, financial, life, spiritual, whatever, um, I tend to go back and say, well, where are the parents? Where were the parents? Why are we so such a, uh, a diverse group of people, humans, uh, who can't do things anymore? So why do we have so many coaches? Not that coaches are bad. It's just that, you know, if we had good parents, if I had good parents, God help me if my parents are listening, one of them is dead already. So I don't have to worry about that. Uh, my dad is dead. Um, to say, hey, you know, I, I've raised you a certain way, but it was incomplete. And so I didn't necessarily have the skill sets that could allow me to do things in the right way. And so because of that, I had to learn how to do things, how to be an adult yeah. while I'm an adult. And so uh, kind of late to the game, but again, from 2021 forward, I've made it my intention to learn how to be an adult um, and learn how to face life as an adult with a better thinking strategy, a better, you know, people say mindset, but it's really about redesigning, mm -hmm. writing the new narrative, writing that new chapter and doing it the right way. So it's figuring life out at the tail end of life, but that's okay for me mm -hmm. because now I can do it right. And it's a lot better this way. Yeah. You've seen what not to do. I can only imagine Keith for being a male, being the provider, the protector of the family. I'm sure that played a big role in your identity. Who am I now if I don't if I'm not providing? It 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 definitely hits um and that's because it's very, you know, socially um identified. Yeah, you're you're the man. You're you're the male head of household. Uh, you've got a daughter, you've got a wife, you've got a house, you've got a retirement fund, you got all this, um, and yet it's all falling apart. And so because of that, the more I wanted to hold on to the things that were slipping mm -hmm. away from me, the more they were slipping away from me. I kind of, kind of you know, very ironic. The more you want to hold on to it, the more it's slipping away. But when I made the thought, when I, when I changed the thinking to say, okay, well, what if, what if things were to literally fall apart? What if the bank foreclosed on the house? What if my, you know, my bank account reads zero? Um, what if? And I said, well, Okay, let's step in. Let's step into that. You know, what if I were to have to go live in a shelter or on the street? Um, when I came to that decision, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. Now, I did have, you know, I always say, you know, I told you I was married, but not the best situation, uh, you know, in this when you're when you can't do your thing in the marital, you know, group. Uh, that puts a whole lot of stress on the relationship. But I did have yeah. a friend. I had, I had one person who said, I'm going to help you. And we're going to mm -hmm. walk through this. And he was my mentor. And I was, can I give a shout out, please, Mitch Gray? Mm -hmm. I do it every time. Um, he's my angel. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was a previous pastor and days gone by. We met at, uh, you know, social, uh, you know, networking events. And, uh, out of the kindness, goodness of his heart, you know, he became my mentor. Now we're really good friends. Mm -hmm. But in the process of becoming a mentor to a friend, he taught me a couple of things. 
breathe. So he taught me to breathe. First, because you have to. But second, when you do it intentionally, it works better. And then he said, show up every day. Now, I've learned some things since then. And showing up means doing exactly what we're doing now. Go to that next interview. Even if you think 100%, you're not going to get it. Go to it anyway. Go to that next social meeting, networking group meeting, whatever. Fill out the next resume. Even if you think there's no chance in whatever that you're going to get the job. Show up. Mm. The more you show up doesn't necessarily get easier, but it gets habitual. And if you could breathe with intention, you could do the showing up part a bit more from a calm, steady state, I guess is the best way to put it, that you could kind of put focus in, you could put energy in. Now, I've learned some things since then. I've learned how to use words and intentionality uh, and other practices, sustainable practices that mm -hmm. keep me alive and not only keep me alive now, but allow me to think about who I really am as a person. Um, so tapping into some spiritual elements, uh, some subconscious thinking elements. And so we could go deep. I don't know how deep you go on your shows, but for making this very practical for your audience members, um, yeah. Yeah. we can. You can show up and you can be focused because our brains are very dynamic entities in and of themselves. So we could train our thoughts to help us show up better. And that's what I did. That's what I learned how to do. Yeah. That's a lot. I'm sorry. Well, that is amazing that you were able to, and it sounds like you faced your fears. You took it. All right. Rather than it rattling around your head and disturbing you. Well, let's let's have a look at it. And you took it. And when you took it to the nth degree, what did you discover, Keith? I discovered that if my life were to fall apart, and it can, everybody's mm -hmm. life can. Life can implode. Um, mm -hmm. One day you could have, you think that you're on whatever, cloud nine, as we call it. And the next day, you know, the... IRS, so our taxes could be, you know, IRS could be knocking at your door. A cop could be knocking at your door. It doesn't really matter. Your wife could leave you. It doesn't really matter. Life can fall apart in an instant. When you have yourself centered, which I do now, you know, I've got the resources now, but when you have your life centered, okay, you can step into that. It's going to be scary. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Life's going to be scary and it can get frustrating and you can get angry. But when you could do three things, now I added two. So I, well, I did two, show up, breathe and show up. And then I added a third one, when you could think with intentionality. So if you show up with the right words in your head, in mm -hmm. your mouth, you could, you could face that fear. So when you took your fear right to what could potentially happen, is that when you saw and you could relax into it. Well, it's not as bad as I imagined. Was that? Well, no, living on the street is kind of scary. <laughs> Somebody who's never done it before. Um, but when you tell yourself that, okay, we're just going to make it, it's going to be a transition. Everybody faces transition. Mm -hmm. You didn't, for me, and again, this is for me. Um, I was ready to step into that transition, but okay. the weirdest thing happened. It didn't happen. All the implosion, all that anxiety that I thought could have, and I'll even give you a straight up response. I hadn't paid my mortgage in four months. My house could have easily been taken from me. Um, when the back, So I slipped through somebody's crack. I, I definitely slipped through the crack somehow. Um, because it was four months out, hadn't paid it. Um, they could easily have foreclosed. I had no clue as to how I slipped through that crack. But mm -hmm. I did. So that means something, somebody, somewhere, somehow is looking out for me, yeah. even a little bit. And so when you recognize the fact that sometimes life does happen, but it doesn't always happen 
it's not going to be the worst. Then your mind says it's going to be okay. And when your mind says that, at least mine did, mm -hmm. you can make the you can take the next step. You can move forward. You can take the next step. Okay. So was this your third suicide attempt? My third in my life, yeah. Can you share what happened? So what you're sharing now was after you was found after. your center and you were able to face your fears. That was sort of a result of your uh, suicide, failed attempt. suicide. Yeah, yeah attempt, mm -hmm. yeah. What happened, Keith? Can you share? Um, ha you, what happened with what? Exactly. That that you, really does need to be clarified. Okay. We can see where your mental state was. Okay. You obviously had to go through a set of decisions to end your life. Can you walk us through that process? I'll share in a moment why why I, I'm... I'm grateful that we're having this conversation and I'll share in a moment why. Absolutely. What I've found in order to answer your question respectfully, the mental health community kind of deters people such as myself who has made the attempt to provide graphic evidence of, you know, of how you went about the process. But what I can oh, use I it, oh, well, it no. yeah, right. So I just want to, I'm, but I'm making that clear to your audience, um, sure. just, in, just in case. Yeah. Um, so there doesn't need to be any clear, um, you know, graphic, whatever. No. And so we'll leave that as it is. The, the frustration and the pain, both physical, emotional, spiritual, that brings somebody to, The point where life is no longer valuable, mm -hmm. it becomes an obsession and it becomes mm -hmm. the only thing that you are willing and wanting to think about. And sometimes that may be a day. It may be a couple of hours in the day. Mm -hmm. It may go on for more than a couple of days. It may go on for a week. You breathe it, you live it, you think it, it becomes part of your body. It's like any any other trauma, even though you haven't experienced the trauma yet. Yeah. It's the trauma of the burden of living, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so the burden of living and thinking this constantly is what sort of gives you the motivation, would you say, to carry carry it out? To carry it out, yes. It's more of there's no sense in living if you can't do anything. You, again, it's, it's, it's a worthlessness. Uh, yeah. And even though you may have people around you, you know, family, friends, um, you know, church members, whatever that space is, when you know you can't take care of yourself, pay your bills, whatever, you know, put food on the table, whatever, you feel worthless. And again, I don't have a mental illness, but when you feel worthless, man, what are you going to do? But when somebody said, we can get through this, somebody gave me permission to live, I took a hold of it. That's my story because I gave myself, somebody gave me permission to live. Okay. Mitch Craig gave me permission to live. And then with every step forward, with every day forward, I learned to give myself permission to live. Okay. I learned to breathe. I learned to sit in this chair and look at that camera mm -hmm. and find a reason to at least stay alive today. But that's not, the whole story. 
because what happened in 2021 and beyond was that, like I said earlier in this conversation, I went and changed everything about my life. Mm -hmm. That meant connecting with people in a different way. Now, to give space to that, give reference to what that meant is, you know, I grew up um, lower middle class, Philadelphia. Um, You know, my parents divorced when I was 10, uh, you know, so I grew up with a mom. Uh, My sister ran away from from home, so she was five years older. And so I kind of grew up by myself. Okay. You know, mom, mom worked, and so... I learned a lot of domestic skills, cooking, cleaning, ironing, the whole nine yards. Um, but I grew up alone. So mm-hmm. there wasn't a whole lot of, I had some friends, but it wasn't like close connected friends. Um, and I carried that throughout my life. And so I never really knew how to connect with people. Okay. So post second suicide attempt, third suicide attempt, I learned how to do that. And I learned how to do that intentionally because I never wanted to face being alone ever again. Mm. And so that's why we're having this conversation because I reached out to you through somebody, um, whoever connected us and everybody else I've connected with and invested myself in them, whatever that space was. Some of it was, you know, making connections. Some of it was friendship. Some of it was professional uh, you know, just as a professional colleague, some of us a podcast host, podcast guest, whatever that space is, I made the intent to connect with people. And the more I connected with people, the more they invested back in me. Mm-hmm. And that's how life changed for yeah. me. Okay. So somebody intervened before you actually did the act itself by the sounds of it. Yes, and that yes. was when you decided, I got to change my life. This yes. is, this is, this is sort of the, the catalyst. Yes. Where I was going with that is For those who are left mourning their loved one who has died by suicide, there are obviously a lot of unanswered questions. There are the myths. Some of them I've heard, they're pretty selfish to choose that route. They couldn't have cared about the family. It's not that at all, is it, Keith? It's, and you mentioned it, it's the sheer pain and as you said it was a spiritual pain it wasn't just physical mental emotional it was deeper eh i don't know how deeper worthlessness can actually be but for somebody to actually think about and want to actually end their own life yeah not selfish at all um, I'm not going to call it heroic, mm-hmm. but you have to recognize that they think, that individual thinks, that by being gone, they've already contemplated. So they may have a life insurance policy or you mm-hmm. know, they strategically thought, well, if I'm not here because I can't be, I'm now a burden. You know, I can't provide for the family. I can't do the things that I typically do. Whatever that looks like, I am now a burden to everybody else around me. So mm. how do you relieve a burden? You get rid of it. Okay. So when other people who are left in the wake of an actual suicide may need to recognize that that's what they're thinking. That's what the individual thinks. Now, again non-mental health, my non-mental illness, suicide attempt or suicide action. Because when life implodes or explodes, whatever the situation is, Mm -hmm. worthlessness, burden, frustration, fear, these are real things. And they're multiplied because the situation never gets better. When you wake up the next day, there is no relief yeah. You know, nobody's offering me a job, you know, eventually I did, somebody did. And so there was mm-hmm. a situation, but there was nobody stepping in and say, you know, we can do this together or 
let's find a way. <laughs> so these are words I, I use now because there is a way. The thing mm-hmm. is, sometimes there needs to be an outside help. Yeah. Truthfully. Yeah. And I would have had to have lost everything. This is kind of how crazy the system is, you know, here in America. I would have literally have had to have lost everything because the house is an asset. Mm-hmm. Um, in order to receive financial help from any of your social services agencies out there, you know, I would literally have to have zero money in the bank, have lost all assets in order for somebody to step in. Because I applied. I applied for help. I'm, so, and I'm a veteran. Like I said, I, my first job was a, as a Marine. I'm a U.S. veteran. And so I should have VA benefits. Mm-hmm. I would have had to have lost everything to receive any U.S. you know, veteran benefit mm-hmm. or any social service benefit. The system really sucks. Yeah. It, it doesn't help to prevent. It's there to heal a big wound with a small band-aid. And that doesn't work. No, because it's it's in the immediate situation where you need the help. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. And I hope for anybody listening, it'll be a help to them. Because I know that that is the biggest question, isn't it? Why? For the for the per, the people that uh, the family members, the friends, yeah. why? Could I have done anything? Could I have seen the signs? Now, is there any words you can share of what a family can be watchful for if if they are suspecting a family member is in this much despair? They're in the day, and so like I say, I'm 54. So in the day, in our in our youth, there was, you know, propaganda. Not that's probably a bad word to say. Look for the signs. Um, giving away stuff, um, telling people goodbye. Sometimes those things are real. Those letters that we leave behind, you know, maybe they're indications of something that's wrong. But look at the actual situation, please. You know, is the marital relationship is it strong is it not strong you know are there gaps or are there are, are there regular forms of communication uh meaning that are you having conversations with your spouse or with your kids or kids to the parents or whatever one thing you know what is the situation like you know are you are there lots of stressors in your life um stressors are a big thing stressors are a real thing they're very traumatic are you about mm-hmm. to lose your house are you about to lose a job uh are you about to get married get divorced um did somebody recently die not of suicide but of whatever automobile accident cancer disease it doesn't matter stressors impact us in very very weird but very profound ways and the body keeps score and you know that because you're a grief coach yeah Okay. Body keeps score of all those things. And so when too many things happen at one time, or there aren't the resources that individual has. So, you know, most of us today, especially, you know, in the past 10 years, we're emotionally bankrupt. We don't know how to deal with their emotions. Most people don't. Most people know that they exist, but don't know how to feel and don't know how to appropriately respond to things. I sure didn't. I didn't. I didn't yeah. have those skills. I didn't have the skill to respond to fear, frustration, anxiety, stress. If I had those skills, I may never have made any of these attempts. Mm -hmm. Didn't have those skills. So going back, I said, where are the parents? Uh, You know, where are the people in our lives who can share and express and be there? Just be there. Yeah. Yeah. Have a conversation. I love that's another myth that just popped up. People are frightened of having that conversation. Well, I might put that idea in their heads. And I don't believe for a moment that that is true. What are your thoughts on that one, Keith? The idea is probably already in the head. Yeah. It's how they're thinking about that. I think more people think about, you know, sometimes it's jokingly, you know, I'm going to kill myself if this doesn't happen. I actually had to. A colleague in, in college, he said, you know, he was going to be an architect. And he said, if I'm not a millionaire by the time I'm 35, and you, you know, we're early 20s. If I'm not a millionaire by the time I'm 35, I'm going to kill myself. So, 
you know, that's that's a mentality. And this was, you know, easily 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, that we we think of it as an option, but having conversations with people is the most valuable thing that you can give. And so you we're both podcast hosts. And so I started my podcast based on the value of the conversation. It, I never in, intended. It would be cool if I could monetize. I never intended my conversations to be monetized. I had conversations because people post COVID, post quarantine, were making intentional shifts in their life. And I gravitated towards those people because they were demonstrating to me. And here I was, you know, trying to recover some way, shape, or form from my my third heart, you know, my my my, my suicide attempt. And a heart attack, you mentioned that earlier. I was trying to find a way to figure things out. And what I was finding was that everybody that I talked to had a piece of the puzzle. They figured life out because they intended to make changes. And so whether it was some type of spiritual practice or some type of mindfulness practice or some type of physical exercise practice or a way of thinking, changing, different. I was finding those people serendipitously and having those conversations and every conversation changed me. Mm -hmm. Every conversation changed me. And I've had a thousand conversations, not all of them recorded. Some of them multiple times with the same people, but every conversation changes you. It adds value to your life because somebody's going to give you a little piece of gold you might not recognize it at the time, but they're going to give you something. They're going to, you know what they're going to give you? And you know what they're going to give you? They're going to give you a little piece of themselves, mm. a piece of their wisdom, a piece of their insight, a piece of their experience, what they've practiced or learned over the years. And all those things together is a pile of coal, that gold at the other end of the rainbow that we try to look for, it's right there. But you know where we we don't know where to find it? And we mm. find it in every conversation. You have it because you have conversations like I do all the time with people who have experienced so much emotional stuff. Yeah. And but every conversation. Through life challenges. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think we can add hope to those that may be listening, who may be experiencing that right now, either contemplating reach out and get help is what I heard you say. For somebody in the US, I'm pretty certain Canada would be the same. We've now got um, a telephone line. It's like, is it 8 A hotline? 988? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that an option if people are really desperate? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you have to text or call. Absolutely. So that and that's be- in that's in the moment of crisis. So if you're yeah. thinking this is it, um, yeah. that you need to talk to somebody and you can't find your pastor or nobody in your immediate space can be of that person, you know, these people are trained professionals, credentialed uh, to help you work through the immediate situation now. If you're in that space, um, they're probably contacting first responders. And so you you maybe uh, have an experience of, you know, 911, you know, knocking. law enforcement come knocking at your door. It's the responsibility of our social system to do that. Mm-hmm. The goal, however, is not to get to that point. The goal, however, is to say, I'm struggling with something. I'm struggling with this emotion or this experience or this situation. They need to contact you or they need to contact me. I will have a conversation with anybody. To sort of. Just to find out where your space is. Yeah. And if you do need crisis intervention, we can get that. Absolutely. We can get that to you. Um, You have to be willing to receive it. It's going to be kind of scary. You may be hospitalized. It's kind of the process. I was never hospitalized. Because I chose not to go in that direction. Yeah. I think as well, Keith, the fact that we are no longer 
churchgoers or we have that spiritual community around us. Those that have that, I think, have to be pretty lucky that they can reach out to their priest or to their pastor, as you have mentioned. How what, how can we get back to building those sort of communities where we're taking care of one another? I know it's a big question and we don't have <laughs> to, to. I'm just putting it out there because... You know how needed that is? That is so needed. And it's just kind of funny that you kind of mentioned that because I know people who uh, are doing that very thing. And so they are building communities. They have their own community model. Um, so anybody who is familiar with me or the stuff that I do, uh, the Envision Speaker Series, we had a, a major four-hour event uh, on January 27th. It was on a YouTube live stream, and now it's uh, record it, but anybody who goes to my YouTube channel can watch four hours of me having a conversation, conversations with 10 different people to talk to me about how that actually works. And so okay. community is a big, important thing because in community, people have responsibilities. They accept their responsibilities. They have roles to play because mm. they want to play them they want that to work. So whatever that role is, if you're, because you mentioned church and I say that because yes, there's a place for that. But most pastors, most priests, most church leaders aren't credentialed, aren't trained in mm. crisis intervention. It may be part of their job, but they're only trained in their biblical, whatever scholarly studies that they have yeah. to, you know, teach their sheep. Mm -hmm. Dealing with emotions, dealing with crisis, dealing with trauma is not their expertise. They may not be the right person to go to. They may be a start, but they're probably not going to be the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People like you who are credentialed are, are part of the answer. You need one, somebody like that. I was just thinking for the spiritual crisis that people may be facing, that they may be able to help with with them. They, they may be, but that may be another conversation because yeah, tech, religious structures have a way of dealing with things, but human being to actually be falls outside of that structure. Um, mm -hmm. it's not everything isn't so clearly outlined that if I'm facing this situation, I do X, Y, and Z, because it, it it separates us from our emotional component. And when we don't put those two together, we're at, a, we're at a, in ourselves, we're at a crisis. And so that's another whole conversation easily because we don't put those two together. And then we don't put the three together because our spirit, emotion, mind, well, four, mind and body, because the body is always involved too. The body holds all of that together. But where did your heart attack come in amongst all of this? And what did you learn from that, Keith? I think I learned the greatest lesson of, of all of this. And so 2022, and I'll give the short story, October 15th, 2022, prior to you know, the whole 22. So we're tail end of 2022. Prior to all that, I, I, I love the exercise. I, I've been doing exercise my whole life. And so when I was 14, had my, you know, massive asthma attack, decided that I'm going to go running, that I was going to be in charge of my asthma. And I was going to learn how to take care of myself physically. And I was pretty good at it. And I was really good at it. Um, but for me, some of that is I liked, I'm a small guy. I'm, I'm five foot six and 145 pounds at most on a good day. And I've always been challenged by that. It's part of my ego. Uh, so I like to train for strength and power and all that kind of stuff, which kind of goes against my body chemistry. Anyway, I was doing that anyway. So consuming a whole lot of proteins, whey, milk, all kind of protein stuff. What I didn't know 
was it was destroying my kidneys. What I did know is that my blood pressure was up. Um, so my blood pressure went from, you know, normal, which is what it is now. So roughly 102 over 70 or, you know, in that really good span. Yeah. Prior to the heart attack, my, my blood pressure was like 130 over 90, 92. So not, not great. And definitely that lower number is not good at all. Um, so once you reach like 85 or or better. Anyway, I was killing myself, basically. Uh, I was intentionally killing myself, not knowing it, because I wanted to look a certain way. Mm. So I guess what my body said, it says, you ain't doing this. Um, my, my body, you know, my, my, my heart shut down, basically one of my arteries, um, you know, clogged up. And, and stupid me, like silly me, uh, I still went out walking that day. <laughs> so I had a heart attack at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and I decided to go to the hospital noon. So, and I also went through a five mile walk, pure pain, but thinking that it's just indigestion in some really bad way. Mm-hmm. Four days later, you know, multi, you know, they put a stent in my heart, you know, keep my artery open, put me on medication, changed my diet, you know, changed everything everything in about my life again and so i do a whole lot more aerobic exercise uh my weight training is a bit different my blood pressure like i said is i'm 102 over 70 so i'm in good space there my kidneys are much much better uh, my diet is so much better not excessive proteins and i have made the uh intention of hiking the Appalachian Trail, which goes from Georgia to Maine here in the States. So 14 states. So uh, I am now training to hike the Appalachian Trail in 2025. Um, And my doctors are just amazed because I put myself, I carry 30 pounds on my back. Okay. And I get up at 2.30 in the morning to hike 12 plus miles a day. Uh, so this is, I don't recommend this type of training for everybody, but because I have a purpose. So I'm on a campaign of, you know, trail to transformation, hiking for hope and healing, which is my mission to raise money, awareness, education, and service provision for those who have been impacted by suicide. Oh my goodness. That is a huge mission. And it's that that keeps you getting up and Going for those times. Yes. Yeah. But my life is wonderful because my body is healthy. My brain is active and alert. Mm. Um, uh, my relationships with people are so, I'm, I'm so much more me than I've ever been in my entire life. It just feels good. Now, God forbid if I die, you know, if I die tomorrow, because that wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be fair at all. Um, you know, get hit by a car or something, uh, because there's so much to do now and life is so much more fun now. Total transformation. It only it's, took three suicide attempts a heart attack. and a heart attack. It sounds like to total- a thousand conversations. And what's that? 1000 conversations counting plus and 1000 conversations counting connection. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm so grateful, as I said. I feel honored that we're having this conversation. I just suspected you'd be able to answer a lot of those questions that I'm certain a lot of families have, and that's the why. And I think you have answered that beautifully, and I so appreciate you for doing that. Do you have any words that you would like to leave families or anybody in a, a situation of dire pain and hopelessness, eh? I don't even think that's a good enough word. It doesn't sound dire enough, eh, to the space that some people can find themselves in. It's scary. Two words of advice for the people around an individual who they suspect is dealing with something very dark and insidious. 
if you don't feel comfortable dealing with the situation, don't deal with the situation. Because what I found in all the conversations that I've had is that when you go into a situation and you say the wrong thing, it's worse than saying nothing at all. So don't. That's one. Now, that doesn't sound good. So what do I do as an option? Go find somebody who can. Go find somebody who can have the conversation. Go find somebody who's not scared to step in and say, hey, how are you doing? Let's talk. And most of the time, and especially if you're trying to get inside a man's thoughts, these emotions, because he's going to deal with stuff behaviorally, most likely. So, drugs, alcohol, whatever addictions. If you see these behaviors and you recognize and you say, this is different, something's different about this person. Mm. You can say, I see something's different about you. You could actually say that. Yeah. Something's going on. And give them the space to say, yeah, you're right. So don't try to, you know, pound them with a bunch of questions or throw guilt in their space. You know, you've been doing this X, Y, and Z, and this isn't right. <laughs> um, just to say, something's different. Do you want to talk? Give them space to talk. I like that question. It opens up space for them to say something if they need to, for sure. And even if it's just, yeah, yeah if, yes, I agree, or I hurt, or go away. Exactly. <laughs> tell yes. you to go away. Go away, yeah. To say no. You can say no. You can say no. I want to sit here with you. And mm -hmm. all you have to do is sit. You don't have to say a word. When they recognize that you are there for them, I think the human body and the brain and the spirit will recognize that. For the most part, again, and we're not dealing, not talking about people with mental illness. I'm just mm -hmm. talking with people who are overwhelmed with circumstance. Yeah. That's, there's a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you so much for this rich conversation. And please send me all the links. I will put them in the show notes for your Appalachian <laughs> Raising Funds. Um, and if somebody wants to get on your podcast, if somebody wants to reach out to you, how can they do that as well? Dr. Keith McNally. D R K E I T H M C N A L O Y. So you can find me on LinkedIn and YouTube. But if you want to connect with me, go to LinkedIn, Dr. Keith Mayali. And That's as long fine. as you're not a social media marketer, I'll connect with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all of that ilk, aren't we? Poor social media people. They are quite unloved. We love um, you, really, don't we? We do love you. Just don't connect with me because. All you'll do is solicit for my attention. <laughs> but anything else, I will definitely have a conversation with you and I will definitely connect with you. And if not, I will, we will follow each other and we'll make sure that we have conversation. That sounds beautiful. And I will get also your YouTube. That sounds great. The four hours of community building, was it? So oh. we did the January 27th. Last year, in 2024. So at the time of this recording last month, a couple of weeks ago, um, we had a special event. So I'm using the Envision Speaker Series as a catalyst for change, mm. uh, to change uh, basically the social ills that we seem to be facing. And so I recognize that people with more influence are doing it as well. But I've designed a space for people to bring their expertise to the table. And not just have a conversation about it, but to offer solutions. And the evolution of that 
is to actually make change. But the underlying foundation of everything that I do is to make sure that people are emotionally well. And when you're emotionally well, you tend to take care of life a little bit differently and a whole lot better. Exactly. And you can look forward to life as you clearly are doing. So it sounds like, Keith, you found your sweet spot in that Venn diagram, I see. You're bringing in all your skills. <laughs> Even your um, IT background, computer sciences, it sounds like the, the technology, the way that you're navigating the podcast world, the YouTube and creating all those wonderful events. So congratulations. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. That's it. That's a wrap for sure. We are clearly out of time. Thank you, listeners. And please, you don't have to grieve alone. Reach out to us. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.